everyone and welcome to Geeks in the Garden. Hey, today we are chatting about the impact that pests can have in our garden. I'm going to have a fandom feature. Karen is going to give us an overview of three ways, I think, to use elderberry. Uh, four, really four. four. Yes, All right, four. You get a BOGO, people. And also uh-huh. we're going to, uh, she's going to give us a little history on our feature plant. So are you ready? Let's dig in. looking for plants to cultivate in my garden, helping pollinators is a definite draw. When I think of wildlife I want in my garden, I think, you know, a lot of people immediately think of pollinators. I mean, selfishly, I love seeing butterflies and even watching the bees buzz about gives me some satisfaction that maybe I am accomplishing something too by osmosis just by watching them. I don't know. Plus, you know, you're helping the environment and the entire food chain by cultivating all those lovely pollen filled plants. Now, of course, um, to try and help my native pollinators, I try to go native whenever I can. I've got a few different kinds of milkweed as well as coneflower, black eyed Susan, sunflowers, etc. But I will admit to the sin of having a butterfly bush because usually it, um, it really draws them in and they just cover it. Sadly, this year, even my um, butterfly bush hasn't drawn a lot of butterflies or caterpillars. I think I heard that the boom then bust of cicadas may have increased the eating habits of birds, maybe. Um, But I have had plenty of bees buzzing about and helping. The birds is always a must anyway. So, um, you know, that's fine. And uh, last year, my sunflowers provided a huge all-you-can-eat buffet for the birds. Um, They hung upside down and gobbled up the seeds, and they were so desperate to get it, they didn't even mind that I was sitting just a few feet away. Um, So I don't have as many sunflowers this year because the deer ate them when they were very um, small. I think it was deer anyway, and we're going to be talking a lot more about that. But um, but in any case, I do have some, and I'm looking forward to bird watching on the sunflowers soon. Of course, one animal this year that I am not a fan of is the oak mites. Oh my goodness. The oak mites basically ruined my August. The oak mites are just a pain in the butt. Um, that was probably more of a pain for them, really, because they didn't eat, get, eat the cicada larvae, the ones that bit me anyway. Um, the oak mites reside in the oak trees, and they really want to eat those cicada larvae as they come out of the trees and drop down to the ground. But if they fall on a person, we'll just go ahead and bite you too. Um, not what they want, but, you know, so it goes. They're willing to bite anything. And boy, the bites were awful. It was painful, itchy, took forever to get rid of. So um, as far as pests are concerned, that is a big one in my book this year. That is, it was crazy. I have never heard of them. And then when you did post about them on social media, I saw a lot of your friends had suffered from them too. It was uh, it was definitely an all you can eat buffet for them as far as the cicada larva. So oh, yeah. hopefully oh, this yeah. will Hopefully this is a one in 17 years. Like I, that is my understanding. Yes. And I contacted our local extension office and they said that by September they would be gone. And I have in fact been outside again, um, recently and I have not knock on wood been bitten. So yeah, hopefully they're done, but yeah, for a (laughs) while I was like just staying inside or if I went outside covering myself up completely, like (laughs) terrified one would drop on me and they're microscopic too. So you don't know you've been bitten until you know, the next day when you're in all this pain. So yeah, that was, that was a thing. That was a thing that happened. That was not great. Um, as far as some other pests in the garden, bunnies and other rodents are cute to see, but can be awful for your plants. I've had them girdle trees or chew all the way around. So now I use small plastic protectors around my saplings. 
And this year I've got a new sort of pest in the house. My lovely fiddly fig tree is now host to the fungus that causes flower pot parasols. These are a kind of bright yellow mushroom that emerge out of the soil and you can get it from contaminated soil or I probably plop some bit of nature in the thing and it just came out of that. They are really cool because they're such a bright color, but they're poisonous to eat. So for the sake of my cats, I've been pulling out as soon as I see them and getting rid of them. Unfortunately, they are just about impossible to get rid of if you love your plant. Um, Of course, they're just the fruiting body of the fungus that is just all throughout the soil. And of course, so are the tree's roots. So that's a bit of a conundrum. Yeah. I was going to say, do you have to repot and then sterilize the roots? Is that something that you're, I mean, I, yeah, I could try and do that, but that does seem like a rather horrific experience for the fiddle leaf fig. I'm not sure I would want my roots sterilized, but you know, (laughs) (laughs) sounds painful. I was going to say, yeah, it's not quite the same thing, but (laughs) (laughs) Not quite, but yeah, so far I'm just plucking out the mushrooms and ditching them, but yeah, I might need more extreme measures. Well, let's see my, my garden pests, um, this year, as I mentioned in the past show, I had my very first experience with deer decimating my garden. I know that many of our listeners have probably already had this happen to them, but I either was very lucky or they just, you know, they hadn't quite found my yard yet. So, um, they, you know, they kind of went to town on established plants, new veggie seedlings, and they definitely destroyed my planned sunflower circle that I had. So I have been researching some things to change up my planning and, you know, I can't convince the deer to move. I'm going to have to make change my garden. So, Um, And this definitely includes moving some of these tastier plants to a part of my yard that's fenced. Um, I'm also planting a prickly bush barrier using some grasses and bushes around my veggie patch. And I've researched the myriad of scents and granules that people have suggested on every garden forum from, uh, there's so many of them. I just really have to kind of go with people I know that, they've had some luck. Um, I am going to be using that fishing wire that you kind of crisscross between posts. It creates sort of an invisible fence. Um, They can feel it and then therefore they don't want to jump over it because they don't know how, you know, where it ends and where it starts. So I'm just going to throw a bunch of things in rotation, (laughs) like everyone that deals with deer and see what works. Uh, now that they've discovered my yard, I really would love to uninvite them to my garden party. So wish me luck. Um, and much like a lot of you, the the, the non-pest part, I, I do spend a lot of time planning to bring my pollinator friends and birds to the yard. We do have a giant hedgerow uh, that lines my yard and that just teems with birds. Um, we have water, which as we know in and attracting our friends, that's uh, important. And we plant with our bee buddies and butterflies in mind. So as with all things gardening, the pests and our problems with them cannot deter us from our endeavors and we persevere. That's as, right. a, as the saying goes, a true gardener plants in threes, one for the pests, one for the weather, and one for yourself. <laughs> that's right. Nevertheless, she persisted, right? That's exactly. Yes. <laughs> so up next we have a short fandom feature um i was having a discussion with karen and i she was like this would make a great one so um i am one of those people i really love uh, the photographers that delve into the world of abandoned buildings they had the forsaken theme parks and forgotten rotting grand homes that get reclaimed by nature have you seen these karen they, there's always these photo spreads um it's like a uh, gorilla art where they go in and they just kind of um document this uh things that have that were that now are part of nature again. So, and it really gives us a view of what the world will look like without humans. Uh, As trees grow up through these former ballrooms or vines twist through a rusting Ferris wheel, or there's this one image where these ducks were roosting on a giant lake 
that was formed from the dripping roof in a former factory. It's just post-apocalyptic surrealism. Um, we did see a glimpse of this, what this world would look like when the world did slow down during the pandemic and nature found a foothold again. There were herds of deer walking down main streets and dolphins and whales were swimming unencumbered in harbors. And there were these wild boar that were sniffing around for food in towns. So recently, my teen has started watching The Walking Dead for the first time. Um, she started it and, and we're about to, I mean, right, I think about a week ago, the very final season of it um, has started. So I was once a fan, but I had turned out, tuned out in later years when a beloved favorite character of mine was killed. Um, I did join her in watching the series once she got past the seasons that I had watched. And one of the things that really struck me was when the mechanical advantages of the modern world were breaking down, the community of characters really had to rely on that past agricultural knowledge. There was, um, you know, an old farmer, there were like um, women that had, you know, grown up doing gardening. And, and that was just really important knowledge for them to survive. It, it really does become man working with nature and not against it. Um, as they became stewards of the land and they created these reliable harvests of food, the tension of constant hunger was relieved. Uh, and then they could kind of be more of a community. There was art that kind of happened. There's, you know, camaraderie. Um, so the knowledge of medicinal herbs was also important in recovery from their battles and viral illnesses. And mixing up those herbs showcase what we've often highlighted on our show, which is the danger and toxicity of some plants. So there was like a plot point about that. Uh, as nature overtakes the world and man learns to work with nature, it remains for man to be its own worst enemy and not the undead after all. So I'm enjoying watching it with my teen again. And as we get into our autumn spooky season, and as always with our geeky eye on all things gardening, even in our pop culture. Great. Well, um, for our making and baking feature, we are talking about the elder tree and in particular, elder flowers and elder berries. Now, staying well is at the top of our minds now as it has been for a while. And when I think of ways to do that, I think elderberries. Maybe because of advertising. First, I think of getting actually the COVID vaccine naturally and eating well and exercising and getting enough sleep and advocating for clean air and water legislation. But after that, yes, elderberries. That is what the elderberry tea box has taught me, that the little berries boost immunity. And this year proved to be the very first that my little Arbor Day um, elder tree saplings actually bore fruit. I planted them a couple of years ago and they were just teeny tiny little sticks and they have grown like crazy. They're super duper tall now. And um, this year they sprouted those gorgeous little elder white flowers that herald the coming of the berries later on in the summer. So um, I decided I was going to really try and use them, um, you know, as much as I could. And making this attempt even more witchy is the challenge that it is actually fairly toxic. Eating the berries raw or even the stems can cause massive GI problems due to the fact that it produces um, cyanide. It's a cyanide producing chemical. So I knew I had to be careful to say the very least, um, but I was not deterred. I persisted. So fortunately, my first experience was with the flowers, which are okay to eat raw as long as you make sure to take off the stems, a very crucial detail. I decided to make um, two things with them. Um, I made a sugar syrup and I made a tincture. Um, tincture has alcohol in it. So after laboriously harvesting and picking out all the bugs of these flowers, and there were quite a number of bugs also enjoying them, I put half in a glass bowl and poured boiling sugar water over them, left that for, you for, for a few days and voila, elder flower syrup. You pour it into some fizzy water, some La Croix, La Croix, and it is a delicious flowery light summer refresher. Completely can um, recommend that one. Now, the other half of the flowers I put in a bowl and poured in some straight up vodka to make my tincture. Just straight up. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is the dark side of my elderflower experiment. Days later, and I had the same idea, but this time the vodka was what was flavored instead of the sugar water. And um, actually a nice shot of that into the fizzy water with the syrup was a truly lovely elderflower squared kind of experience. Very nice. Um, now, if only I had had more luck with the berries, um, the berries did not prove to be such a success and in fact caused quite amount of stress for me. Um, they emerged just as they shed from the flowers I'd left deeply purple, heavy enough to bend the plant considerably. Um, and I harvested them with a fork, just like I read online that you should, the fork tines are spaced, um, just the perfect way so that you can get them off the plant, but still it took quite a lot of time to pick out all the stems and other pieces with that added pressure constantly going on and well, maybe I'd poison myself if I missed any, which is quite a lot of pressure. Um, now I think maybe if I'd waited a little bit longer, this process might've been easier. I did it right as soon as they were ripe, but, um, a few weeks later they looked even riper. So that might've been easier if I waited. So I had found a recipe for elderberry jam online that didn't call for pectin. And um, basically you just had to boil the rinse smashed elderberries in water and sugar and juice. And I did all that, put it in the pot. I watched eagerly to see these poisonous little balls transform into healthy, happy food. And <laughs> it did indeed form into a lovely jam. But then I just kept boiling for good measure. And soon it formed into a thick, viscous, boiling hot sugary mass. I think I probably should have just quit while I was ahead, but you know, the whole poison thing over your head does like make you want to really do it properly. But um, in any case, the resulting mixture when cooled, coated your teeth instantly and stuck them completely together. Like it really made it less of a delightful tea time snack and more of like a weapon you can use on your enemies. <laughs> like, oh, look, you can no longer move your mouth or your teeth. <laughs> so, oh, well, live and learn. Um, the fourth thing that I did with this um, is I thought maybe I'd make elderberry syrup. So I used a sieve um, on the jam and just took out all the elderberries parts. Um, and that did create a syrup, but then when cooled, just turned into basically non-edible artwork that if you tried to eat it, I'm sure you would break all of your teeth. So my advice, start with the flowers. That's a good starter elder tree um, activity. And if you are going to move on to the berries, um, maybe use a different recipe than I did. Respect the boiling time. Pectin probably would have been a good idea. Who knows? Oh, yeah. And my last bit of advice, just don't poison yourself and don't make yourself vomit. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good ending advice. So I, I like love, it love, love to hear, you know, if you do find a recipe that works, because I think I told you anytime I'm at a, uh, a bar or restaurant, and they have elderberry, like cocktails, or, you know, an elderberry syrup over you know, fruit or something. It's like, it's an instant order for me. It's like, mm -hmm. I always get it. So yeah, I say keep playing around. And I'd love to hear an update. Yeah, absolutely. I certainly will. I'm sure like all good witchy things, it takes practice, right? <laughs> so, I should think so. All right. So for our plant feature, we are doing sunflowers. This is the time of year when fields of wide, gorgeous yellow faces pop up over farms, beckoning selfie takers to pose with them. Now, all flowers are amazing, but sunflowers are particularly breathtaking, maybe because they grow so tall, so wide, and then they move that bulk around throughout the day to follow their namesake. It's truly incredible just watching them go from one end of the yard looking and then to the other. But where did all this originate? Well, sunflowers are as American as apple pie, 
more so in fact, because apples didn't actually get here until the late 16th century. Well, sunflowers uh, were cultivated by American Indians about 5,000 years ago. So they've been here a long time used for the seeds. They were mashed into flour or they were eaten whole, or um, they also extracted the oil from the sunflower seeds. So you might've heard of the American Indian idea of planting a three sisters garden, which traditionally had corn beans and squash. These are all crops that grow well together. Well, sunflowers have been also considered the fourth sister because they lure birds away with their seeds and they attract pollinators. So they're also great to have near your three sisters garden. Now, Spanish explorers brought the sunflower to Europe around 1500, where it was largely just ornamental until the 1700s when it made its way to Russia and found a populace that had been denied many kinds of oils during Lent. You know, we must suffer during Lent. That is something we do. And I guess in particular in Russia, but sunflower oil was not among the forbidden items. And as such, Russia became the hotspot for sunflower cultivation. And in fact, by 1880, you could buy the mammoth Russian sunflower variety in America. Um, bringing the sunflower back home and introducing us to the bevy of sunflower varieties we can buy now. I thought that was interesting because I didn't really think of sunflowers as a Russian thing in particular, but they are. Of course, the sunflower has come a long way since the BC era. Like many plants, they have been specifically bred to be the way we want them. So sunflowers now are taller I'll by a lot. They're wider and they're more oily. They didn't used to be as oily as they are. Still, it's nice to think that people even 5,000 years ago got excited looking at a sunflower field just like we do. It is a great plant, whether it's bread in the making or a selfie station. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, and then we're going to go into plant news. Uh, speaking of interesting, um, just found a couple little tidbits that uh, kind of fit into this category. So according to The Guardian, a new study funded by the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council, um, they have found that giving bumblebees a dose of caffeine has the same effect a cup of coffee might have on humans. So because of climate change has made pollinators like bees, moths, birds, beetles, wasps, and butterflies relocate due to habitat loss and the use of pesticides, um, managed pollinators like commercial bumblebee colonies have tur to, uh, turned into some important part of our fruit growers' crops. However, while a nest of bumblebees sounds adorable, they aren't always very helpful. Some bees get very distracted by flowers, kind of like us, yeah. uh, or they've refused to leave their nest, like my introverted daughter, uh, resulting in half-pollinated crops. So, and that's not a good thing. So researchers from the study wanted to evaluate if bees could be primed to target specific odors, like odors from certain crops. They mix caffeine, sugar, and then the target flower smell, like that of strawberry flowers, and spread the scented blend throughout the nets. So when bees in laboratory were set loose around robotic flowers covered in different odors, one being the target odor, researchers found increased interest in the flower coated in the target scent. This experiment did not disrupt the lifespan of these bees. So this study is a step in the direction to ensure fully pollinated crops. However, large scale trials would need to be conducted successfully before the method is used in the real world. So I found a very interesting <laughs> little fascinated bee. But wait, that's kind of work culture. We're just going to work these poor bees to death. So, yeah. <laughs> at least so, they'll be and, happy doing it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe if we give them some, you know, creamer or something with it, <laughs> little flour <laughs> oat milk or something. Yeah. Or, you know, it is pumpkin uh, spice season. Oh, <gasps> pumpkin spiced. Yes. Cat like flower <laughs> pollen. Is that a thing? Oh, yeah, just pumpkin flowers. Okay. This is happening. I can see okay. it. <laughs> And looking forward, uh, this week, the Farmer's Almanac has posted their predictions for our upcoming winter, and they are calling it this season of shivers mm. for many of the U.S., with the Almanac's auditor calling it one of the longest and coldest winters we've seen in years. Oh, man, so come on, can we get a break? Get those cozy, well, actually, you know, my grandfather, the farmer, used to say sometimes 
a good hard freeze, like the, the next year's garden is just robust. Like sometimes, you know, that is good for the garden might not be good for us, but it's good for the garden. Yeah. Maybe we just appreciate the garden more like any green leaf and be like, Oh my God. Well, no, he, he said that things that, you know, especially bulbs, things that have, you know, that produce every year that they would, that hard freeze made them like wake up and be more robust. I don't, I just remember him always saying a hard freeze is good for the garden. Sometimes. Oh, so like suffering builds character, even among plants then perhaps, perhaps I say that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Oh, we thought we'd wrap up the show as always by sharing some stuff that we're digging right now. Yes, indeed. So I am digging a book about fungus. Now, odds are you might have already heard about this book about fungus, even though that doesn't sound like something that would be tremendously popular. Um, Kat and I both know that it has a really long wait list at the library. So um, yep, I'm number actually, 16 still. <laughs> yeah, right. I couldn't believe I got it. I was like, oh my gosh, I better pick it up right away so I don't waste this precious time with Entangled Life. That is the book name here. It's how fungi make our worlds, change our minds and shape our futures. And um, it's one of those wonderful kind of nature books that blend the science knowledge with life philosophy, you know, and I think we've done a lot of that with plants. Um, I know Michael Pollan is always my go-to. I love how he does that with the plant world. Well, here, um, Merlin Sheldrake, the uh, author, um, is uh, bringing that to the fungi world and just um, showing us just how pervasive and important they are. Unfortunately, they're pervasive and important in my fiddly fig plant right now because they just keep making mushrooms in my house plant. But um, yeah, this book is fascinating and I love thinking about fungus, how it can be so, you know, detrimental. I mean, a fungus is killing all of the, you know, the frogs right now, which is terrible. But then also, you know, there are fungus that they're trying to get that could eat all the plastic and maybe actually save us from this mess we've, you know, created for ourselves. Who knows? Um, yeah. Fungi are just, you know, that, that thing that binds us all together, like the force, you know, fungi is kind of the force, I think maybe a little bit. So, um, I am excited. I'm going to try and read it as quickly as I can while still savoring it so that I can get it out to all those other fungus lovers out there. There seems to be quite a lot of you. That's right. Hurry up and read the book, everybody, so I can get my turn on it. That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I actually am cheating. I have two uh, things I'm digging on this week. So the first one is just really short. And it's just, you know, there are some people that are just delightfully charming and quirky, and they just make you smile no matter what. And there is this online personality. Her name's Ali Spagnoli, um, A-L-I-S-P-A-G-N-O-L-A. -I, -I, I think it's at Ali Spagnoli. Um, she did something, she always does these little crazy videos like online personalities do. Um, but she's just, you know, she's in the musical theater. She's just, it's kind of, if, if you took Pee Wee Herman's like energy and positivity and you put it in like this, you know, um, who's the girl who does crazy ex-girlfriend? Like, oh yeah. Uh, Rachel Bloom. Yeah. So in a little bit of Rachel Bloom and then she's completely her own person too. But anyway, this, she had covered her, um, Volkswagen bug in, uh, AstroTurf. And, uh, that was a, something she did a long time ago, but she decided, I guess the past week or two to, um, to try and make her car into a Chia pet, a giant Chia pet. <laughs> And she just kind of goes through the process on her YouTube channel. And it's just, it's just this fun experiment as it's growing, as what she's doing. And then just the sheer delight of everyone when, you know, I, no spoilers, but yes, it works. And she makes her car into this giant Chia pet. It's a living thing. And just the joy of people, you know, we, we just need so much joy right now. <laughs> um, and she just, the sheer joy of people as they touch it and they realize it's this living Thing on her car that she drives around and it's you know so anyway that's my little thing um that brought me a little joy but the the real thing I'm digging on is it's a podcast um that I've listened to in the past but like anyone who loves podcasts like you do obviously um I get behind on certain podcasts like I, I'll go through phases but it is a podcast called Ologies with Allie Ward and 
anyone that's into the natural world or science probably knows this podcast. Have you ever listened to it, Karen? No, I haven't, but um, I think I'm definitely going to try and look it up here. I'm still looking at pictures of this woman's chia card. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is so, amazing. Well, um, the reason why I, I remembered ologies again is so every week it's, it's kind of humor and science and just really interesting people. And every week she takes on an ology like a, you know, a different science. And the reason why I found is I remember that she had done one on deer. Um, And so I had gone back and listened to the one on deer because she talked to two scientists and it's cervidology. That's the study of deer. Um, And it ends up, it's a two-parter and it just, you know, it's, bananas, the facts and the information that they give you. And it really gave me an appreciation of deer again, but also like, um, it's really interesting what they're learning. And there are some things that they're learning about how to, um, uninvite them to your garden, let's say. So anyway, ologies by Allie Ward. Uh, the one that I listened to on Servidology is from September, 2020. But every week, again, she talks to an amazing scientist. There's one that I really loved uh, about space junk. Um, there's the volcano, you know, vol- volcanologist. There's just different, um, different scientists every week. Really interesting. And she's, she's really funny. So she brings out the best in her guests. So that's what I'm digging on. So. Wonderful. I'm going to give that a listen for sure. All right. Well, please come and find us on Instagram at Geeks in the Garden or on Facebook at Geeks in the Garden. You can find extra content and details on our blog, which is geeksinthegarden.weebly.com or search on YouTube for our channel, Geeks in the Garden. And please subscribe on Apple Podcasts if you haven't. Uh, Follow us on Spotify or all the fine podcast streamers. We would love to hear any comments or questions you have at geeksgardenpodcasts at gmail.com. And please join us for our next episode where we're going to highlight some of the East Coast garden tourism spots, uh, including hopefully a field trip report Mm -hmm. um, for some place that Karen and I want to go visit. And we're going to discuss some fall bulb planting. So go get dirty and have some fun.